Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, pleasure to be back. John, where does Clean Tech's Sunrise Nickel Cobalt Project stand today? Jim, I think things are looking a lot better than they did uh, a few months ago when we talked about it. Back then, they had Floor Australia, the engineering company, do a review of the DFS that they had done in 2018, and the outlook was not particularly good, and the company ended up taking $150 million write-off on that project. And since then, in September, they announced a plan to do a 10-for-1 rollback and spin out their water purification business as a as a separate uh, entity from the Sunrise Project. Uh, this was uh, canceled in mid-October, and on November 5th, they delisted from the TSX exchange, saying uh, not enough volume on that exchange and too much regulatory headache. But they changed the name of the project uh, to Sunrise Battery Materials Project, and that's different from that. They're, they're spinning it now as a turnkey type of system to make not just nickel cobalt and, and possibly scandium, but all the way to the end members, the uh, nickel sulfate, nickel co- or cobalt sulfate that goes into the lithium ion battery. And they've also announced the financing. They're, they're raising $22 million at 25 cents, uh, 87.9 million shares. That'll boost uh, fully diluted to 865 million uh, shares. Uh, Robert Friedland is investing $3 million and the major Chinese shareholder, Pingjing International, it's also putting up $3 million. And they'll, they'll own $104 million for Pingjing and $107 million for Robert. So they'll set both have still substantial stakes. But they're also doing this strange Australian thing. It's like a rights offering. Uh, it's a, a, a deal where a, 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 they call it a share purchase plan where any of the uh, 7,000 or so shareholders that are registered that live in Australia uh, and New Zealand or New Zealand uh, can subscribe up to $30,000 worth of uh, stock at 25 cents. And, and if all of them took that to the maximum, ponied up uh, uh, $30,000, that would raise $210 million and result in the issue of another 840 million shares, pushing fully diluted to one point seven. 7 billion shares and definitely creating a big war chest for clean tech, which as of June 30th was down to about 30, 30, 35 million dollars in, in working capital. Now obviously not everybody who happens to own clean tech shares and lives in Australia or New Zealand is going to do this 30,000, 30,000 uh, dollar, uh, right style of a rights offering. And, and of course I think we mentioned that, uh, they started a drill program on the Sunrise Deposit, which is really a laterite sitting on top of a dunite intrusion, an ultramafic intrusion. And some of the past drilling, when it went deeper than the laterite horizon, which has been the focus of all the historical work in which the nickel cobalt uh, scandium resource is based on, it had intersected some past decent uh, uh, platinum grades. And the laterite itself, it has about a million ounces of platinum in it, but it's a 0.33 gram per ton grade, and it's in a mineral form that's very difficult to extract from. So those million ounces are basically worthless, but they think that there may be these pipe-like zones within that dunite body which have elevated platinum. So they started a six-hole drill program. Uh, they expect to have the assays for the first three holes sometime uh sometime in January. I think that is really just a distraction uh, because the real question is, can the Sunrise deposit be profitably put into production? Now, this um, updated uh, DFS that Floor produced, uh, it still doesn't really cut the grade in terms of being worth developing. Its NPV was U.S. $1.2 billion but its capex was 1.8 billion and its IRR was uh, 15.4%. Now that's kind of uh that that's not even as good as what FPX Nickel came up with with its Dakar project 
and they used 775 a pound nickel as their base case price. But for the Sunrise project, this updated DFS, they used uh, uh, $27 a pound for cobalt and $11 per pound for nickel. And nickel right now is about 720 a pound and cobalt's about $16 per pound. So for this project to fly, um, it really, need, not even fly, even to be considered for possible development, we need to see significant increases in nickel and cobalt. And in the case of nickel, uh, they're including a premium pricing for nickel sulfate, which is the form required to make the lithium ion battery. And with their type of HPAL based the ion exchange flow sheet, they'll be able to make um, nickel sulfate and cobalt sulfate directly from from this operation. Now, in, in a pa past Discovery Watch episode, I talked about uh, an open letter that the CEO, Sam Riggle, had written to the end users, the manufacturers, uh, complaining about the fact that they always just looked at the current metal price in terms of uh, assessing the economics of a mining mining project. And that's not just the end users who are doing that. It's, it's everybody in the financial sector. They will not produce cap fund capex for a project if the project doesn't fly at the metal prices that we have today. But in cases such as nickel and cobalt, which uh, uh, along with uh, manganese are the key inputs for the lithium ion battery, that seems to be the, the preferred option for the emerging electric vehicle fleet. In, in the case of these um, types of batteries, demand is going to go up significantly beyond what you would expect from global economic growth getting back on track and eventually, uh, you know, bringing up the, the price of uh, nickel and cobalt. This is new demand coming from new technology. And Sam asked the end users, look at your own business models. What are you expecting to sell in terms of electric vehicles by 2025? And do you think that that extra demand this will require as a collective is going to be met by the current metal supply? And when nickel prices do something crazy in 2025, like they did in 2007, when the supply-demand imbalance created by, by, by the rise of China caused nickel to run all the way to $25 a pound, are you going to come to us then and say, Yes, we will buy all your nickel and cobalt uh, from the Sunrise deposit. Well, it takes two to three years to do the final permitting, the engineering, and to build and commission such a mine. So you guys should be thinking ahead down the road and backing projects like this, even though they're not in the money at the metal prices we have today, you should think of what the metal prices might be down down the road. You know, that's never really going to work. But there's something else that's now emerging, which is really, really interesting. Um, the company is starting to focus on its ESG credentials. Now, E stands for environment. And a basic question would be, how much carbon dioxide was generated in making your electric vehicle? S stands for social. How much social collateral damage is being caused by the mines that supply your metal? And G stands for governance. What sort of dirty under-the-table deals had to be done with the thugs who run the country in which the mine is located? Now, Cleantech's Sunrise Project doesn't have any obvious social license problems uh, or governance problem being located in a farming area of Australia's New South Wales. So the question really is about emissions. And this becomes a question about the flow sheet being deployed to make the nickel sulfate and the cobalt sulfate. How much carbon dioxide is consumed to make your pound of nickel and pound of cobalt uh, compared to other, say, sulfide mines or, or more traditional laterite mines? And, and is it a lower number? Can you quantify this carbon dioxide footprint on a per metal basis? And the end users uh, 
Uh, they are increasingly in these areas of uh, green energy where they are pitching to consumers the cleanness of their their products. Um, they they are trying to argue that we're not just selling you a cool Tesla. We're also selling you a conscience lotion, something to make you feel good about the contribution or, or, or lack of bad contribution that you're making to the future uh, as far as you know climate change and that is concerned. And this is where something I came across something quite interesting last week. Uh, Robert Friedland did an interview with Eric Townsend of uh, Smarter Markets. And if you just Google Smarter Markets podcast, you will get it. It's about an hour and 10 minutes long. Uh, the first 54 minutes or so deal uh, with, with more general topics, such as the four metals that Robert thinks are going to be key to the energy future. And these are aluminum, nickel, copper, and surprisingly, he mentioned scandium. Aluminum obviously is important because it is good for light weighting as an alternative to steel, but because it's a relatively weak metal, the scandium comes into play as an alloy to make aluminum effective as a light weighting alternative to steel and therefore use lower lower energy and carbon dioxide or or even energy in general. And copper obviously is uh is the wiring that makes all things electric run. And the nickel, because of its increasing role in the lithium-ion battery, he expects the demand to grow above and beyond what the general you know, growth of the global economy will be. And, and the, the, the podcast is quite interesting. He touches on a, a, lot, of, a lot of things. Uh, um, but what the whole thing was sponsored by was an entity called the ABAX Exchange. And this was a startup that he, Lucas Lundin, and others invested in several years ago. It's based in Singapore. And its goal is to create a blockchain-based digital market which specializes in uh, uh, enabling uh, producers to sell metals, commodities that have an ESG certification of some sort attached to it. And this entity is doing a reverse takeover of a TSX uh, iron company called New Millennium Iron Corp. It'll undergo a 12 for 1 rollback and there's supposed to be about 60 million shares outstanding uh, when this is all done. And uh, based on the 35 cent stock of New Millennium, which is still trading right now, uh, this is, implies a $200 million valuation. Now, what Robert is doing is is really interesting because you know, he can pitch this idea that Sunrise is going to be able to produce uh, nickel and cobalt with very high ESG credentials. But how do you put a price on it? So rather than just trying to jawbone uh, end users into uh, you know doing this, he's invested in a technology which will make it transparent for the price discovery of what an ESG credit is actually worth. Now, to, to put this into a context that our Discovery Watch uh, um, um, audiences can understand, I've talked a lot about Scandium International this year and its uh, effort to get a hosting deal with one of the copper oxide leaching uh, operations in the United States. Uh, Freeport's the obvious one with, with six mines in America, which uh, you know produce copper using SXEW. And if they get a hosting deal, and they've been working on this for six months, they'll be in a position to set up a, a, a plant using ion exchange, and they filed patents for doing this, which would be able to recover metals that end up being dissolved in the heap, but which Freeport does not recover because it uses solvent extraction to get the copper out, of which there's a lot because it's you know good grade ore. There's lesser grade of all these other elements, but some of them end up also being dissolved by the acid. Freeport and others have tried to get these extra metals out of their solutions. Uh, mostly they've only succeeded when it's gold or silver because these are so high value compared to metals like manganese, uh, cobalt, and nickel. And, and so the raffinate ends up just being pumped back into the heap leach pile where it circulates uh, through again, picks up more copper. And this goes round and round in circles 
until there's no copper left. And then the, uh, the, the, the whatever the, 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 the raffinate just allow it to sit and there evaporate and everything precipitates back to where it's gone. And yet the, these dissolving these extra metals does in, indirectly consume energy because it consumes the acid. And so it is a com- it is a complete waste of these metals. And and you know when you talk about the the various R's and in, uh, in clean energy uh, and the green movement, you 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 hear about reuse, repair, recycle. But one that isn't mentioned as often is recovery. Recovering stuff that is somehow coming into existence but not being harnessed and used for some sort of productive good. So if Scandium International were to get this hosting deal, were to set up this facility and start producing manganese, uh, cobalt, uh, um, nickel as, as byproducts. It also hopes to produce scandium and it will use that itself to make master alloy and try and build the offtake market so that eventually it can raise the hundred million to put its uh, Ningen mine into production as a primary scalable source. Of, of scandium, but all these other things that they recover from the waste stream, they'll have to figure out how to sell it. But because this is an established operation, everything that comes out will be certifiable in terms of, well, how much carbon dioxide was consumed in pulling this metal out of this waste stream. And, and of course, right now, if they try to sell it in Hong Kong, the traders will say, well, we'll give you a, a discount to it because you don't have huge volumes for it. So they won't even get the market price. But if they were to become one of the early customers of this ABAX exchange, they could put, say, five tons of nickel uh, of high purity into this system certified as coming from such and such report mine with so and so many carbon dioxide units. And then end users could go in there and bid on this and compete with each other bidding, yes, I will take those five tons. And then they will have a verifiable uh, chain of, of custody showing here is where my numbers come from so that when I tell you my Tesla consumes only so and so many uh, tons of uh, carbon dioxide in its production, I can actually prove it. And your allegations that I'm just a greenwashing BSer, forget about that. So this ABAX exchange uh, is something significant. And if it works, it will also have benefits for, I think, the whole junior sector, in particular areas such as rare earths. Right now, most of these rare earth deposits outside of China, they're not going anywhere because the China price is so low. But the China price is subsidized by China's own policies, such as weak emission controls. In the case of the heavy rare earths, which come out of south, the ionic clays in, in southeast China, uh, those are produced in very inefficient, wasteful, and polluting manners, often by criminal organizations. But basically, they set the price and make it impossible for uh, companies with projects in countries where there are rules in place to to have responsible development. Well, in this future where we need to move away from relying on China and the end users, and, and of course, electric vehicles, they use an awful lot of uh, uh, the neodymium and the perseodymium reverse for the permanent magnets and they need the dysprosium and terbium to dope them so that they don't lose their magnetism at high operating temperatures. These companies could end up putting their rare earths into the ABAX exchange and groups could bid on it and, and also have, you know, certifiable ESG credentials for that particular input. And what Robert Friedland has done is he's leaped way ahead of the problem Sunrise has, which is not a small-scale operation such as what SCY's, uh, you know, a waste stream recovery operation would be. He's building a market for or helping build a market which will price ESG credentials so that when the big guys go, like a Tesla, uh, goes in there and sees that there's a futures market pricing uh, high-rated nickel with, uh, with a high-rated e- high ESG rating, they can say, okay, we will do a long-term offtake deal on Sunrise that uses the price you need to make this worth developing for you. So it's a far-sighted way of solving a problem that you cannot solve directly because Robert Friedland, much as he might wish, 
cannot change what the global price for LME nickel is right now. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, Azimut Exploration reported final results for its Elmer project. What is the upshot? Well, Jim, it, it seems that uh, what we figured out in late June, early July, when they first produced an update, uh, is pretty much the way it has shaped out. Now, recall that in January, they published results from the drilling they did in November, December last year on the Patwan outcrop, and that was roughly a sort of 100 by 100 meter outcropping, highly solidified area where they had some good uh, uh, gold values in, in, in channel samples. And when they drilled it, they got excellent uh, results. Uh, it was a system of dilational veins um, that uh, if uh, you know that ran high grade gold, and they tested it down to about only 100 meters. Uh, in the drilling that they have done since then. They've chased it down to a couple hundred meters, and yes, this is this type of orogenic gold system where, where the, um, the gold grade can persist to thousands of meters. But when they stepped along the strike of this um, shear zone corridor, it was like you, you had this ball in the middle, but then it feathered out, elongated, and, and uh, the, the, the grade basically disappeared. So they have almost a pipe-like body, and the next stage that they have to do is chase this down deeper. And in their uh, news release, uh, in, 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 in the presentation that accompanied it, they compared it to the Rory's Knoll uh, body in the that Guyana Goldfields has as part of its Aurora mining oper- operation, which has now been taken over by a Chinese Chinese company. And they also compare it to the Goldex um, operation in, in the Abitibi belt, which is, does not have much of a strike, but it goes down several thousand meters and even gets better deeper down than it is at surface. So that's the story that they're pitching pitching for this uh, this Pat One project, the prospect within the overall Elmer property. But the other thing they haven't really told us yet, though they've hinted that that they have some ideas, is how many more such uh, sort of swellings within this particular uh, unit uh, between the country rock and this intrusion are there where these dilational veins developed and, and that soaked up the gold. And the strategy earlier this year was to chase after these IP anomalies because the gold appeared to be associated with the the, the sulfides that were in the Pat Wan zone. But none of these other... Uh, IP anomalies uh, yielded any significant uh, gold, uh, gold, gold, uh, gold, gold, gold grades uh, within that sort of uh, one and a half kilometer radius over which they did their IP survey grid. But they do have this interpreted seven kilometer long corridor that they call the shear structure. And what we were hoping to see in the new year is that they have developed other targets Within that, what they're going to use as the targeting model is not quite clear. Obviously, the the Patwan outcrop was an outcrop because it was so solidified and therefore resistive to erosion. Much of the rest of that corridor is covered by uh, overburden or swamp, uh, which means that uh, whatever it is that caused this Patwan prospect uh, to get so enriched with gold wasn't happening over there. But there's no way that this can exist just by itself. There's this little, small, sort of 150 by 
150 meter pipe like body within this large area. So the market's uh, you know, a bit bummed out right now. The stock's trading in the 80, 85 cent range. Uh, they did raise six million dollars at uh, at dollar eighty uh, a few months ago, and they plan to go back in in January with a major drill program. We still haven't heard anything about the Piqua copper prospect. Uh, there was no mention of that in the news release. Uh, sometimes no news is good news, but I have a feeling that in this case. Uh, the PICWA probably will not have found a center of gravity that makes it a much better prospect than the mithril prospect that uh, Midland Exploration explored uh, a, uh, you know, almost two years ago when we first got excited about that copper trend in, uh, in the James Bay region. So for now, the uh, Patwan prospect in the Elmer project uh, has, has, has disappointed in terms of demonstrating size but it still has down plunge potential and we wait to see what additional targets within that property they have developed for when they go back to work in January. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the U.S., AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John Serengeti and Sun Metals announced a merger. Is this a good thing? It depends on your perspective. Um, you know, a month or so ago, we at Discovery or I at Discovery Watch gave up on Sun Metals when they put out a results from the drilling on the Stardust project. And just as in the prior year, they failed to tell us what the rest of the holes were, where they were doing. Uh, yes, we can see that the 421 zone is this plunging body, but from all the diagrams that they um, produced, uh, it looked like pretty much this was all that we were going to get, but this was only like just uh, uh, over half of the program of holes that they had planned, and we're still waiting for the remaining assays to see what they accomplished uh, on the Stardust project. Now, Serengeti, we also talked about, and our initial focus was the Quanica project, which is to the south of Stardust. But more recently, I introduced the East Nith project, which is farther north, which appears to be a brand new copper gold porphyry system that's had some exploration on its peripheries in the past, but it itself has never been recognized as a major target. And that helped the stock up to 30, 35 cents where it has been Recently, uh, we're still waiting the last of the uh, Quanica drilling that they did that they did this summer, which dilutes the Koreans down uh, down a few percentage points. Uh, and of course, they can't go to work on drilling the uh, East Nive project until June June of next year. So there wasn't a huge amount of new information going to come from Serengeti, but uh, I was pretty optimistic that this was going to be a strong company heading into 2021, especially with copper prices on an uptrend. They made a seven-year seven, seven year high this week. So when the merger now was announced, uh, the uh, reaction from Serengeti people was uh, fair, fairly negative at first. But when you looked closer at the deal, what's happening is that um, Sun Metals will merge into Serengeti on a 0.43 uh, Sun Metals for one Serengeti share. And uh, once that is done, they will do a two-for-one rollback after that. So, so this is kind of a, you know, almost like a four-for-one rollback for the Sun Metals people. But at the same time, they announced this uh, 
uh, 64 million unit financing at 12 and a half cents with a, a half warrant at 18 cents. And demand, and this was a bot deal. This is the kind where the, the brokerage firms, PI Financial and Haywood, they're on the hook coming up with the money no matter what if it has to come out of their their own their own their, their own uh, um, bank account so, so obviously they're going to work hard to place it and this has now been upsized uh, to to nine million uh, nine million dollars uh, 72 million units and there's a green shoe which allows them to place another 1.3 million dollars so that would be a total ultimately of uh, you know 83 million units and in terms of post rollback price, that twelve and a half cents is fifty eight cents with the new merged company and eighty four cents for the warrant. And I like this deal because the financing power behind um, Sun Metals is Marco Day, who's done quite well with his other couple companies, Discovery Metals and, and Liberty Gold. And Sun Metals has been a big disappointment. And Serengeti has had Dave Moore in charge of it for the last 12, 14 years. And Dave does a fantastic job explaining a story, getting people excited about, but he doesn't really have the financing clout of a Marco Day. And Mark's been pretty fed up with us on Metals. Uh, it was basically run by Steve Robertson and uh, Don McGinnis. Uh, they will not be part of the new company that emerges uh, Mark O'Day is becoming the executive chairman as opposed to a non-executive chairman, which means he's rolling up his sleeves and he's going to be the financing muscle of this company. The merged company will have uh, more than $10 million working capital. Uh, they still have results from Stardust and Quanica. There are potential synergies between Stardust and the Quanica project when the Koreans originally uh, invested to uh, acquire their 35% stake, they understood that Quinica by itself wasn't quite big enough to be a standalone operation. And they envisioned it as a type of hub and spoke system where other projects in the region would end up feeding a centralized uh, uh, a mining mining operation. And this vision is still a is still conceivable, especially if uh, further work at Stardust uh, Finds more of this high-grade uh, copper, copper, copper scarn mineralization. But couple, a, a month ago, Sun Metals also took the step of doing a deal with Tech to acquire the 51% of Lorraine of the Lorraine project. And this is a project where there's some controversy about how effectively did did uh, did Tech do the exploration when they earned their original their, their their original stake in this project. Uh, and it's, it's a potential rethink. And of course, what the, uh, Serengeti owns is the Top Cat project, which is to the north of it, uh, where there's also been sort of haphazard work done. There's been something done here, something there. But the combined project could become a major new exploration play that builds on the work done by the, the past operators on those two properties, now consolidating one. And of course, the East Nev, is, is, a, is going to be a brand new um, exploration play with a significant footprint, and that could result in a brand new standalone discovery in that part of the world. So the combined entity uh, will end up having a lot of money. It'll have multiple copper projects in British Columbia. Uh, it's an excellent because already you know pounds and even gold ounces in the ground for for the Quanica prospect uh, or, 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 or deposit. Uh, this is an excellent company to own as a copper hybrid where there's potentially economic uh, resources already in the ground and potential to make additional discoveries in British Columbia. And obviously, they'll now have the money to hit the Quanica harder to check out that north lobe to see if indeed there is something better at depth. And there will probably be a new set of eyes looking at the Stardust project to see what's beyond that plunging 421 uh, pipe-like pipe -like structure. And EastNiv itself could become a brand new exploration discovery in 2021. So in my view, it is a positive development. It puts financing muscle behind this company, and it puts a, a bunch of projects, copper projects, under one roof so that for anybody looking for a copper vehicle heading into 2021 with copper on a tear, this is an excellent development. 
John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been talking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.